Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 213 for October 4th, 2013. How Cadillac is making its cars lighter than BMW. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Peter D. John, how are you? I'm doing good. Good to be here in the studio. We've got uh, the brand new Cadillac CTS here. We've got David Leone, the head of all performance vehicles, luxury vehicles at GM. We'll be talking yeah. with him. Lindsey Brook was supposed to be here. He's with, you know, SAE International. Uh, he's stuck in traffic, yeah. don't you know? So he'll join us uh, later in the show here. But what have you been doing this week? Driving one of my favorite all-time cars, the Volkswagen GTI, which I just... Uh, you know what? If somebody said, okay, Pete, it's over, you can't drive whatever it is you want, you got one car and you've got 30 grand to spend, uh, I'd be hard pressed not to get a GTI. I just love the thing. I mean, if you're into driving and you're an enthusiast, but you have real world stuff to deal with, I, it's just fantastic. And like we were saying earlier, I would like to drive it. Have that, the Fiesta ST and the Focus ST the same week, so you could just switch back and one forth. to one to one, yeah. and have a, a track nearby too. Yeah. So it's not just street driving, because those are all good track cars. Yeah. But wow, I mean, it is just fantastic. I, I just can't say enough about it. And I've been in electrics and plugins this week. EV hell. <laughs> I had uh, the Fiat 500e, the Fit Honda Fit EV, and the Ford Fusion Energy plug-in, and uh, just very interesting. Uh, three very different kind of cars, um, but I can sort of see why you know electrics aren't selling all that great. They're pricey. I mean, they really are pricey, and. Uh, there's some limitations to all of them. I'm not just talking driving range, but like in the trunk of the, the Fusion, there's not a lot of room because the battery takes up so much space. Yeah. I... But it's, I mean, they work. And uh, both the Honda and the Fiat, they're very responsive. I mean, they scoot around. And, and I love how quiet they are. To me, that's one of the best attributes of electric cars, just how quiet they are. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I respect the technology and I think they'll play a part in the nation's fleet going forward, but. A small part. A small part. One thing, uh, you know, we got September car sales came out yeah. earlier this week and uh, actually the market wasn't that bad. You know, there were two fewer selling days in September this year versus last year. So if you look at the raw numbers, it looks like the market was down. You take that into account that there were two fewer days, and actually on a daily selling rate basis, the market was up. But not EVs and plug-ins. They fell like almost 30 percent, 27, something like that. You know, I think the market, uh, there are signs that we're going into a slower period, I think. I really do. Well... Let's see. Because Number one, there's no way we can maintain the rate of growth that we've had in this country for the last three years. That's, you know, that was just a bunch of catch up yeah. and we've almost caught up. Um, I know the people at Wards are forecasting the fourth quarter will be better. So let's see where better it falls. Better than what, a year ago? Oh, definitely better than a year ago, but even better than what we've been running at lately. Well, I don't know. So we'll, we'll see, but... Uh, it's GM was flat though. GM Chevrolet was, was yeah, was, Chevy was down. GM's flat for the year. Yeah. 
Hey, look, as I've said, you cannot have a weak Chevrolet and a strong General Motors. You, you got to have a strong Chevy yeah. to, to do that. But Ford had a great month. They did, you know, just terrific. Chrysler was pretty good there, too. Subaru, the, the most amazing car company out there, had another knock-it-out-of-the-park month. I don't know how they do that every, every month. It's just astonishing. Yeah, I don't either. I don't know if you saw it too today, uh, they just announced Volvo just pushed out their guy running Volvo of America. And they're yeah. finding, Cause they're about the only company that's down this year. I mean, they're, they're really struggling, but it's all got to do with, they haven't had a new model in I don't know how long. Yeah, it's, they got their work cut out. I don't know what they're gonna do. I mean, they showed the nice concept at Frankfurt, but Nice concepts are a dime a dozen in this business. That's right. Unless you have it in the showroom, uh, it doesn't really count. No, it doesn't. So what else have you got? Well, yeah. you know, it was a week ago today that I left this show and went to go see the movie Rush mm -hmm. because I had an early screening of it. Although, <laughs> not so early as a bunch of other people have had, but... Yeah, I, I have not seen it. So. To me, it was okay. It, it, I, I give it a B minus. Uh, people are shocked that I, you know, don't gush about the movie and how great it is and everything. Well, racing fans have to get over the fact that it's a racing movie and step back a little bit. But that's hard to do because racing enthusiasts don't get movies about the sport very often. Very rarely. So, so it's hard to step back and say. Like you've just said, it's B minus, whatever. I mean, it's look, if you're an F1 fan, especially a racing fan, you should absolutely go see it. it it's, there are certain moments in it that are actually quite good. But the thing that I didn't get is it seems to be a very dark movie from the way it's shot. I don't mean like, yeah. you know, noir. I mean, it's, it's like oversaturated colors or something like that. And, some of the starts of the races, you get this bird's eye view as if you're behind the field but above it. And it, I don't know, it just seemed like the, it didn't seem realistic to me what they, they were creating there. And, you know, I, I hate to sound like uh, an old fart, but, you know, the 1966 movie Grand Prix, from a cinematography standpoint, I, I just think it's a better movie. Yeah. Did you see that... Uh, Documentary on Senna. Yeah, that that was very well done. Um, it was very interesting about the man. Right. But as far as and you know they had that famous uh, in car footage from his like perfect lap at Monaco, mm -hmm. which is still stunning. But as a compelling visual piece, uh, it's hard to beat Grand Prix. What happened in there? Well, that was a movie made by a great director. Yeah. Senna was a fantastic documentary. You know, if you're not into F1 or racing, I'm not sure how much you'd like Senna. But from learning about the man, as you said, and how intense he was, yeah. it was superb. And uh, I thought Rush was missing some of that. Plus, uh, you know, I've read a lot of interviews with Nicky Lauda, and he said that he and James got along just fine, you know. That, Whereas the movie makes it out like it's yeah. a bitter rivalry and between them. he said, you know, he understands creative license. Hey, Lindsey Brook is here. Come on in. Have a seat and uh, put on a microphone. You got to mic yourself up right here on the seat. Peter, how you doing? Hey, Lindsey, how are you? Yeah, just clip that up uh, on your jacket. That ought to be good. Maybe a little higher. So you were at the, the movie Rush, right? I enjoyed it. I, I, I give it a B minus. I, I give it a B minus. I had to go back and look at Lauda's autobiography, where I think he was much more kind of friendly in his view towards, um, towards Hunt. That's what Peter was just saying. Uh, all the interviews, he said, you know. Uh, that, that, that he liked the guy. Yeah, he didn't and, have that issue. And... I have not seen the movie, but I, I understand they bring up an earlier race in Formula 3 or something, and I, it never happened. Apparently. Right, right. And, and also, they live together, which is not 
talked about in the story at all. They were like roommates, I think, in England during the Formula 3 And the Formula times. 4 days or whatever, yeah. So it's like, how much can you hate somebody after you've lived with them? You know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you want to retract that statement? Right, right. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, I mean, we're all looking at it from, you know, from a technical perspective. Um, my big question from that whole movie is, how do people have sex in airplane bathrooms? <laughs> I mean, I, I can't even comb my hair in one, you know? Because that's one of the scenes with James Hunt. That, that's with one of the, one the scenes, of the right, right. right yeah. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, it was neat revisiting that. I mean, I went to Watkins Glen in 74 70, and, and 75 to see the Formula One race. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of those guys, Regazzoni and Schechter and, right. and those guys, and I was thinking, was it... Uh, who was the driver at the Glen in practice who was decapitated? Francois Severt. Severt, right. Uh, Jackie uh, Stewart's teammate in 73. Right. I, was, I was there. I, was, I went to the Glen Formula One race in 71 and 73. Hmm. I was there, I want to say, 76 and, and that 79. Was, uh, right. That was Stewart's last race. I mean, he, well, he didn't, he didn't run that weekend. He withdrew. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah, wasn't that like his hundredth Grand Prix? Didn't Jackie run like he ran a hundred or ninety nine races? Okay, won twenty seven out of ninety nine. Yeah, but uh, when Francois Sever was killed, that was pretty much it. Yeah, well, that was back in the era where right. it was not uncommon to lose a driver a year, right. in, right. at least in some motorsports. It, it seemed like the bottom level of Armco was right at roll bar level in a lot of these tracks. <laughs> I mean, that was terrible, and that was, you know, there was a lot of grit in that movie. Um, removing Lauda's bandages mm -hmm. was a little bit tough for anybody that's tried to pull off a Band-Aid. I mean, that was, you know. Uh, but it's nice to see a Formula One, a Grand Prix movie out, you know. Pretty well done, I mean, from Ron Howard. Yeah. yeah. But to me, it was like, the story's a good storyline, and obviously that's why Ron Howard, who admitted that he was never a racing fan before he got involved, it's right. the story, right. you know, especially, you know, Lauda's accident, I remember when it happened, I'm sure you, we all do, yeah. you know, horribly burned, they said, boy, he's going to die, then it was like, okay, he didn't die, but he'll never return, then it was like, well, he'll never return for a few years, and then maybe next year, and what was it, three races six, he missed? Six weeks. Incredible. It's unbelievable. That, that is one of the sporting great comeback of all time. Comeback of all time, yeah. So th I'm sure that's what got Ron Howard interested. It was like, mm -hmm. oh my, and then, you know, Hunt only wins the championship by one point at the end. So right. it's like, uh, it's a good story. Well, yeah. because Lauda stepped out of the car. Correct. For, for the conditions in uh, Japan. Right. Yeah, incredible. And we did get one aerial view of the six-wheel uh, turtle. The turtle. You know? I know. Oh, God, I was going, you know, I was beside myself. Yeah, they, it, they just sort of glanced by it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then uh, the Brabham's, which I thought were some of the most handsome right. F1 cars at the time, yeah. you only got little bits and glimpses of them. Yeah. So I, I, I understand. Ron Howard's not out there to make an F1 movie. He, he wants, you know, the public to go and, and watch this thing. Yeah, Steve McQueen made the movie for the race enthusiasts. Le Mans. Uh, the uh, Public Be Damned, which was Le Mans, which used real footage, which is still fabulous today to watch it, mm -hmm. you know, with the big long tail 917s. Right. And, but you better be a racing fan yeah, if you're yeah, going to watch Le Mans, there, yeah, no, because there's no story. It's yeah, just about the race. And that's fine. Um, but... Yeah, I, I, I look forward to seeing Rush, but it would be hard for me to understand that it would have the impact of, like, Grand Prix mm. yeah, in 66. Yeah, no. See, we're torturing Peter not having seen the film and bringing out all these details. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. I mean, yeah. I've read about the movie. I'm yeah. pretty much the storyboard. Well, the trailer's fantastic, yeah. the tra like most trailers are. It's right. like, geez, I want to see that movie. Yeah. But, you know, we're sitting there with all these auto riders, and uh, Chubba Chet is sitting next to me, you know. And so when they showed that scene when uh, Lauda was in his hotel room, and he's watching the racing going on, and he had a helmet, he had a full-coverage helmet. And, you know, he tries to put it on over this incredibly bandaged head, and he can't quite get it on. And, you know, Chubb and everybody else are saying, well, if he was a real racer, he'd spread the bottom of the helmet, you know. And the one scene in the cylinder where you see the valves moving up and down, but there's no spark plug. <laughs> 
<laughs> torturous kind of stuff, you know? But yeah, I think, John, I think I'd give it a B, B minus. That, that's what I give it. Yeah. Look, it, there's several moments in the movie that are terrific. Right. But at the end, I just went, eh, okay, it's a nice movie. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, I, I've heard so many others gushing about what a great movie and Ron Howard, what a fantastic job and da, 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 da. It's like... You should go see the movie, but don't get your expectations up too high is yeah. the way I see it. I wonder how it's played in kind of the fuddy-duddy uh, uh, British road racing environment, you know, to, to the people who kind of live and die by this. Good question. I don't know. Yeah. I, I haven't heard anything on that. Yeah. So. so what do you, Peter and I were talking about, He's he's been gushing about the, the Golf GTI that he's been driving. I've, I've been into hybrids and pl or plugins and EVs this week. Well, I just got out of a, uh, a Jag F Type, the S. That's what I'm driving car. home tonight. I saw that out in the parking lot. Yeah. Uh, and we just wrote about this very sophisticated uh, exhaust system that it, it kind of has a growl and you push a button, it's got a different growl. And, you know, I got in the car uh, when I first got into it uh, up, at, up at work and I noticed someone getting into a car next to mine. And, you know, you're just kind of adjusting the mirrors and so forth and push the starter button and on non-loud, I look at my mirror and this guy practically has a heart attack. He jumps backwards and, you know, what the heck was that? Uh, and I think the car, I mean, the car I drove was a, almost $104,000. You could buy a nice Corvette and get a lot of work done in your kitchen for that amount of money. You know what I mean? Um, and it's... It's a fine car. It's got great road manners, but I'm not sure that exhaust system. I think it's a little too boy racery for a car. Now that's in that, on the V8, though, right? In the V8, correct. So the V6, and I, like I said, I haven't driven the car yet, but the people I've talked to who have all seem to prefer the V6. They say mm. it's a better balanced car and, and not as raucous as the 8. Yeah, it was just a little too raucous. I mean, it got looks everywhere you go. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the C7's getting looks, but these are just different kinds of looks, you know. Um, you know, I like the car, so that's, that's what I've been in. And I've got a whole bunch of, I got a Fiat 500E coming up, so it's going to be a real change. I know. Well, you that's know? what I'm just getting out of. I've been in a 500E, a Fit EV, yeah. and a, a Fusion plug-in. And you noticed in our um, North American Car and Truck of the Year, the first kind of weaning of the, uh, of, of the candidates, the EVs struck out. Yeah. Um, you know. And that's, that's kind well, of an indicator know, of the times, I think. Yeah, and, and for anybody listening that isn't aware, uh, you know, we, we of the North American Car and Truck of the Jury have gotten down to our short list, which is still a good sure. size. It's what, 10, 12 vehicles? 10, 10 cars. 10 yeah. cars, 10 trucks. Right. But I can see why the EVs struck out, because I think in the award we're looking for something that's really all new. Mm -hmm. The 500E is just an electric version of a 500. It's been out there for a while. Right. As an example. So th that's kind of my thinking on why the EVs didn't make it. Are you wondering how Corvette and F-Type are going to do in this? Well, you know, it's the thing about the F-Type is, is it's purposely a departure from anything to do with Jaguar, I think. I mean, they, they've made that clear. I mean, the advertising, the positioning was it's a badass car. Because they're trying to go after young people who, you know, they don't, they don't manage in the string back gloves and the, you know, stopping for tea out in the country road and the your tweed cap and your XK120 and, um, but I don't know because, um, you know, there's a lot to like about the car, uh, but I also get the feeling that, with the technology available today to all the manufacturers, it's almost like. If you're ex car company and you want to dial up a performance car, you can dial up a performance car. I mean, if you have some savvy technical people, you can do it. And to me, that's what that car feels like. Mm. I mean, on the one hand, I you know, if it keeps Jaguar alive, that's great. But on the other, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. And you know, I still have this thing with Jags. With I'd like to drive one. I haven't driven the car. I've certainly been around it, sat in it. Seen them on the road, they're all over the place here, you know, mm. manufacturer plates on them. Mm. So they look good in the road, but I, you know, I don't know. It's, 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 it's kind of a detached thing for me. 
like I, I try to look at it and I try to say, well, could there be another car emblem on that? And I could say, yeah, there could be another car emblem on that. There could be a Hyundai emblem on that. Hmm. Or a, I don't know, Kia. Wow. I mean, to me, it, it looks like a Jag, well, especially the front end. It does a little bit, and then, I don't know, it kind of it, it kind of looks like an alt proposal for the C7. That's some, you know, <laughs> let's not do the Star Wars design. Let's do something a little different, you know, mm -hmm. so they were like two Corvette cans. I mean, I'm not knocking it at all. I, I hope they do well with it. I really do. I Jag's just, doing pretty well right now, Yeah. you know, uh, globally, too. Yeah. I, I do not like the the XF advertising, which is all smoky burnouts. I mean, I'm so sick of manu high performance man cars manufacturers doing smoky burnouts. There's got to be something else. I agree. Anything with that. else? Right. Than showing that. How about Cadillacs uh, driving around the roads around Monaco at high speed through European tunnels? Well, that was the ATS campaign, and they spent a bundle on that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that was a kind of a different premise. They had, they were coming from nowhere, and they had to have some frame of reference. They had to establish, they had to make noise, and they certainly did. I mean, I, I think they did. I mean, some of that was, I mean, Jeff Ward, a good buddy of mine, shot it, and uh, Derek Hill, Bill Hill's son, was one of the drivers. And, uh, you know, I think it was cool. I think it achieved what they wanted, which was, they were nowhere with the car, and they had to have visibility. Well, and they, Ooh, they shot in a bunch of different locations. They made little stories about it. So, I mean, they're, they're still running parts of those yeah. ads now. So they haven't grown old, I don't think. You know, I, I watch them, and I don't think, where's the remote? i got, you know, got to turn this thing off. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, getting back to your point about uh, car of the year, my guess is uh, the Corvette and the Jag F-Type will not do that well. Only because traditionally, uh, you're, you're talking about for our audience the North American Car of the Year in conjunction with the Detroit Auto Show. Correct. Correct. And that's a separate, like, fifty person. Yeah, fifty people on the jury, uh, journalists from all across the U.S. and Canada. And this is what its tenth year. No, it's more than that now. What are we up to? It's fifteen anyway. It's got to be at least fifteen. Yeah. Yeah, but because before the show didn't really have an award, and all well, it's not a show award, you know. Right, right. It's, it's associate. It's in conjunction. But let's just say this: the U.S. didn't have their award. The European had Car of the Year, and correct. and this is the U.S. version correct. that happens to be announced at the, at Detroit, the Detroit show. show but exactly it's not right. affiliated with show. True. Right. Right. But I, I was just going to say, I just think there's, you're talking about an all new vehicle with the C7. Mm -hmm. It's a two-seater. The natural gravity of a lot of these awards is kind of utility and functionality and four doors and, you know, that kind of thing. But if you can't give it to a car, I'm not saying I'm going to vote for it, but if you can't bring that into kind of the finalist consideration, a, a, a U.S. icon that's all new and for, for the value of whatever it is, 55 and change for a base model, I, again, compared to this 104 for the Jag, um, you know, to me, it fits, it, it fits what this award is supposed to be, but it's up against, you know, CTS and Impala and Cadenza and, you know, so I, I agree. I think it's going to get filtered out after this round. Well, you know, if you look at the first five years or so of the award, it was always Mercedes or BMW or something expensive. Yeah. And then I think the jury went, what are we doing here? What, what's the real purpose of the award? And, you know, the thinking was, well, this should be for the car buying public to say, look, you 50 journalists, you drive everything. You drive it all. And so collectively, you've come to this one car that's the best. Mm -hmm. So the thinking was, let's, you know, we shouldn't be picking $100,000 cars. It's way beyond what the car buying public can even dream of touching. But maybe that's run its course. Maybe well, I, we've, I, I we've done it, too much uh, for the masses. So there are 10 car finalists and 10 truck finalists? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I think there's 12, 12 on each side because there was ties in each. So we just let it play out till the next number. I, so. I, I'm with you, Lindsay. I would be shocked if the C7 doesn't win car of the year. 
I, I mean, you know, it's, it's that value equation that there's nothing that has that performance technology, et cetera, f for the money of the base car. Mm -hmm. So. And it is a standout car. I mean, but there's so much this year. That's, you know, uh, I think there's actually fewer models than, I, what did, did I count? 46 different models think, were on the long list. That was the long list, right. But I, I want to say last year it was like 54 or something like that. Uh, because I kept making the point that's more than one a week. Literally, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's almost a new car coming out in the American market every single week. Incredible, yeah. And that doesn't include the commercial stuff. You know, we're not including all these uh, Ducato vans right. and whatever. NVs. Yeah, and, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Promaster. Right. So uh, what do you guys think about Kia's move with the, the K9 that they're going to bring here? I think it's a mistake. You know, here's... Because the Equus hasn't done well for Hyundai, right? Not at all. It, it hasn't, but uh, I, you look, Hyundai said from the very beginning, we're not going to sell a lot of these things. Yeah. What do they do, 400 a month? I will I, be interested. I, that, that, I thought that car was very interesting. I will be interested because they really understand that they're nowhere without design. The next generation of the Equus is absolutely key. No that, question, that, because the current one is... Uh, that will have to be a visually arresting piece. If it isn't, they're nowhere. And the K9 looks a whole lot better yeah, it than does the Equus. The, yeah, it does. And again, that's the, the Peter mm. Schreier uh, influence. But I think it's a mistake for Hyundai and Kia to go head-to-head -head against each yeah, other all the way up and down the line. I, I'm sorry. I would, I, I would take I, the, Kia much more aggressive performance and Hyundai should be, you know, a little more sophisticated. I mean, they shouldn't have two competing unless the Kia is like a, you know, a 450 horsepower R or something different. Mm -hmm. But I, I agree with you, John. I think they're, but, you know, uh, the Koreans don't like to be told what to do. And they, you know, they fire executives left and right who disagree. And that sounds like what's happening at Volvo, by the way. Well, you know, Volvo, it's pretty easy to see. You know, that sales have been going down all year long. September comes out. It's the worst month yet. Boom, the CEO's gone. But there's yeah. a fight. Or you know, president, there's whatever. There's an internal it's fight where the Chinese want to take it and when, where the people actually oh, have oh, car oh, experience. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I hear what you're and saying. And then the Korean companies, it's like if they want to do something, we're going to do it. And if mm -hmm. you disagree, you'll be gone. Yeah. Well, you guys know John Kravchik, the CEO of Hyundai, and you bring up Kia to him, and it's kind of like you're bringing up, you know, a completely alien organization. Right. You know? His best line to me was, oh, we hate them twice. We hate them in the boardroom. We hate them in the showroom. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, to that point, and, and you've got this kind of Sloan hierarchy that you're kind of building up on each side that... Uh, you know, step on each other in the marketplace. Absolutely. See, I mean, the, the thing is, though, so far it has worked brilliantly well. But I think that long term, and maybe the long term is not that far out, they're going to start to collide. You know, yep. they're, yeah, there's some different personality, definitely different styling between the two. But I mean, the footprint where they're competing in the showroom is uh, replicated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do they still have left to go? I mean, Hyundai's talked about a light duty truck for a long time I and mean, there's perhaps an opening there. But, you know, we've been talking about a sports car. You know, would they do a, a shared platform sports car? I think that would really be terrible for both of those brands. And talking about Equus and K9, it's the same thing. I mean, at what point do they really start to separate themselves? Well, you know, you can do it with styling, but that only works for a while. Yeah. And I think it'd be a mistake. Uh, yeah, I think you're right, John. It can only, it's only going to work for a while, but they will clash. I mean, it's worked like gangbusters so far, but it's going to start to come apart. If they're not careful, if, you know, and I don't know how they resolve this because uh, they're two very proud organizations. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you know, like you were saying before, I mean, Kia doesn't like Hyundai and Hyundai doesn't like Kia. But, you know, that, that's actually good. That's the that's good competition. That's like, you know, Chevy and Pontiac or Olds and yeah, Buick but, fighting in but, the old days. Yeah, but look at GM. You know, GM reduced divisions and everything, but they still have clashes in the market. They still have vehicles on top stepping on each other mm -hmm. in the market. And so 
Hyundai and Kia are going to get to that point. Well, Hyundai and Kia even more so because, like I said, the footprint in the showroom is, is the same in each showroom. And pricing is, is very, very similar. So styling only gets you so far. At some point, the inherent character of the car has got to be different. Right. And they've got to be really focused on two very different audiences that they're going after. And I know they believe that they're there, but you know, when I hear that Kia's going to get its version of the Equus, uh, I, I don't take that as a good sign. Oh, different styling, John, and some different steering and transmission calibration, and <laughs> <laughs> who knows the difference, <laughs> Who knows right? the difference, right? I just hope they don't get lost in themselves and decide to do a pickup. I think that would just be a disaster. Yeah, I, I agree, Peter. Yeah, I mean, everyone's tempted, right? You know, I mean, let's face it, I mean, there's one thing that the American car companies do the very best. I mean, look at Toyota. I mean, Toyota, you'd think on paper, oh, Toyota's muscle, Toyota's dealers, Toyota's everything, and they hired talented American truck-based engineers to do it, but... Yeah. They haven't cracked the code. No, and, and Nissan didn't either, and, you know, that's just the way it is here. Yeah. And I don't think it'd be any different for a Hyundai pickup. It'd be a massive investment and oh. huge risk. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, why don't we take a, a quick commercial break and get our guest, guest David Leone, in here. So, uh, Ben, let's give a shout-out to our friends at Bridgestone. Introducing a car company that's never made a single car. Legendary durability. Impressive mileage. Firestone tires. So unstrap the saddle. These old stallions are ready to run again. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Whether it's on television, online, or through social media, AutoLine knows how to effectively get your marketing message to the people you want to reach. Contact Stacy Eman today. Well, David Leon, great to have you back here with us on After Hours. Great to be here, John. Thank you. Welcome, David. Thank you. Hey, Dave. Now, you, you got to explain your title a little bit because I always thought you were like the chief engineer at Cadillac, but now it's chief executive engineer for all lux luxury performance vehicles at GM. Yeah, I'm the executive chief engineer for performance luxury cars. And what that means is, is that I have responsibility for the Cadillac ATS, the Cadillac CTS, um, and I'm also the brand champion within product development for all the Cadillacs to look after them, make sure they're executed consistently, whether it's the new Escalade or the SRX or XTS. Um, but in addition to that, I also look over the Camaro team and the uh, Chevy SS team as well. So I'm very fortunate because I have the fun products that... Uh, I was going to say, that, what so, yeah, in other words, uh, there are true believers... And then there are true believers. <laughs> there are. <laughs> and, and I believe. Yeah, <laughs> this is one of them. And you brought one of your babies with you today. We got the new CTS here in the studio with us. Which we, looks great. We did. Thank you. Yeah, no, we're very proud of it. This is uh, all new for 2014. It's Not a facelift. Not a facelift. And um, I, I would venture to say it's the first time in, what, 70 years, John, that something is longer, lower, wider, and lighter. From Detroit. Right. Yeah, we've gotten longer, lower, wider, and a whole lot heavier. But yeah, run through some of the stats on this because it's very impressive. Sure. Yeah, the, the new car is actually five inches longer than the 2013 car it replaces. Which is a lot, really. Which is significant. The wheelbase is 1.3 inches longer, and it's 250 pounds lighter than the car it replaces. 250 And that pounds. just doesn't happen. That's 7% of your body mass. So think about yeah. the guys in the room here. <laughs> and if you could take 7% of your mass off uh -huh. and put it in the places that you wanted to, which is what we got to do with this car, just imagine how much stronger you'd be. And that's exactly what this is. Now, is this the same platform or whatever you guys are calling it these days architecture as the ATS? We started with the award-winning architecture of the ATS, and we expanded and elevated it in every metric you can talk about. The wheelbase is longer, but it's more sophisticated, more refined, more luxurious, it has more performance, um, and uh, it is the same foundation, um, but we grew it from there. It's wider track, 
longer wheelbase. Uh, the overhangs in the front are uh, at very close. We tried to make them very nice and tidy, um, and that gives us the ability to put the tires out near the corners. Um, the rear overhang is extended for some additional trunk volume. But uh, no. So what version is this? This is a rear wheel drive? This is a 3.6 liter rear wheel drive car. Um, and uh, and this you can get uh, all wheel drive? You can. You can get all wheel drive with both our 2 liter turbo and our 3.6 naturally aspirated. And then we have our new CTS V Sport, which is a model that's kind of bridging the gap between the standard CTS sedans and the ultimate high performance V series. And that one comes with a 3.6 liter twin turbo, uh, 420 horsepower, 430 pound-feet of torque, uh, 0 to 60 in 4.4 seconds, and a top speed of about 172 miles an hour. And that's, Gee, and, that, that, and that's the mild, you're saying there's going to be a V beyond that? There eventually will be. <laughs> but uh, that's only available on all-wheel drive? That's only rear-wheel drive. Only rear-wheel rear drive. Okay. Yes, and this is our, actually our first application of eight-speed transmissions as well. Good. Yeah, the three six, uh, both three sixes come with the eight-speed transmission. And tell me about the two-liter turbo. What kind of power um, is that? Sure. Uh, we elevated the two-liter turbo power this year as well. It's 272 horsepower, um, but we raised the torque uh, from uh, about 265 to actually um, 295 pound-feet of torque. And that propels this car from 0 to 60 in 6.1 seconds. And it's a 30 mile per gallon highway car. Yeah, now see, that's a, you know, that's a pretty compelling package there. It really is. And it, it just it drives beautifully. Lindsay's had a chance to drive it here a little over a week ago. Dynamite. Dynamite. I'm curious, though, the 2 liter turbo for this, uh, you know, I can see that car, that engine in the ATS, but in a larger car. What are you guys looking at in terms of the market kind of accepting four-cylinder engines, even with boosting, in, in sure. you know, a five-series class, for lack of a better descriptor? Sure. The, the two-liter turbos are actually going to be very popular engines. They are in this segment uh, with Audi. They are with uh, BMW. And they will be with our customer as well. And there may be some reluctance until you drive it. But once you get in and drive it and you feel that torque to torque, on the two-liter turbo is actually higher than it is on the V6 naturally aspirated engine. Hmm. Uh, the, the V6 is 275 pound-feet of torque. This one's 295. But it's also how the torque comes on. So it how does. is it in that regard? Yeah. It, it uh, actually comes on very smooth and very quickly. We have 90% of the peak torque available at 1,800 RPM. With the turbo? With the turbo. Yeah. That's, That's impressive. That's great. Yeah. To me, it's all about the feel, the throttle tip in, though. It, you know, it is. How it's calibrated. It, it, you're absolutely right, Peter. And uh, we worked really hard to make that very smooth, but yet very responsive. And so, um, you know, driving it is going to be the, uh, the ultimate test. But um, I really do think that the customers are going to really pick up on it. You know, nobody can tell you what the ultimate penetration is going to be until people are buying them. And I'm happy to tell you that we're now shipping them to dealers. Started this week and uh, had uh, first sales this week. And so uh, we're off to the races here. So this, this, uh, this car, you know, when the ATS came out, everyone was scratching their heads. Well, wait a minute. It's, you know, ATS, CTS. But now this car, clearly, there's a clear demarcation now for Cadillac. Three series is ATS, five series is CTS in terms of size. I mean, you're really going after we, BMW. We are, and it allows us to put the car right in the middle of the uh, mid-luxury segment. And your XTS is your seven series. Full size. Full yeah, size. Yeah. You're Eight working six, on something A6, better than that. Uh, competitor, <laughs> yes. So. The, the, the car that doesn't exist. That's right. That's right. What car? What Dave, car? has this been rung out on the Nürburgring as, it as has. per it has. previous Cadillacs? Did you run the V-Sport at the Nürburgring? We ran the just... V-Sport at the Nürburgring, and uh, we came in with the 814 track time, which is actually six seconds faster than the first V-Series sedan uh, CTS that we did in uh, 2005. That's so a huge difference. Yes, yeah, amazing. Six seconds faster, yeah. and uh, this one's lighter and stronger, and it just uh, just feels uh, fantastic. Hey, speaking of lighter, you, you sent us some pictures of some of the engineering aspects sure. of this car. Ben, let's bring up the first third. one, and Dave, maybe you can narrate yeah. us through these things. 
Gladly. Yeah. We're going to kind of start at the front of the car because when you're laying out vehicles, uh, mass reduction is important up front of the in the front of the car, even more so than it is in the rear of the car because you've got to try and offset the um, powertrain mass, which is the centroid up front. And so um, we put a lot of value and importance on taking mass out of the front of the car. This is, on the left, you see the front bumper beam from the 2013 CTS, and on the right, you see the beam from the 2014. And, and what so we should explain, uh, describe to anybody who's listening to the podcast is the older version is, is the one in black. It's in black. It's much bigger, it, longer. It's, it is. It's multiple made of, pieces. It is. It's a, a multiple piece weldment. It's made of steel. And that one comes in at 21.1 pounds. The new one in aluminum comes in at 8 pounds. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and it's not fabricated. No, it's not. It's a uh, extrusion that's roll formed. Okay, and there's only two little small welded reinforcements in it. So even though the aluminum may cost more total cost without pretty having close. to fabricate different pieces, pretty, pretty it's close. Probably pretty not close. that different, right? Sixty-two percent mass savings. Sixty-two. Man. So and and this is how you do it, David. You you go through these little bit by bit by bit, and then at the end, it totals up to... 250 pounds. That's What's the motto of the team? Our mantra on the team, as it was with the ATS, is we count every gram every day by every engineer. And so we, no gram earns its way on the car that isn't absolutely deserving. And we go through and we have our reviews and we remove uh, any unnecessary mass. We want to see the fine and out models. We want to see where it's stressed. And if it isn't stressed, take it out. And that's the approach that we use. Cool. So, okay, next shot. Next shot. Um, this also up front in the car should be the front shock towers. Okay, on the bottom here, you see our front shock tower in steel. Stamped. Stamped steel. Uh, it's a weldman also, and it comes in at 19.2 pounds. On top is the cast aluminum shock tower that comes in at 12 pounds. So this is a 36% mass reduction. It's cast aluminum that's riv bonded to the motor compartment rail that you see up on top and so we do join aluminum and steel here there's a oh, adhesive and rivets that attach the two and it uh, generates a 36 percent mass savings now don't you have to keep steel and aluminum separate from you one can another isolate so them so you don't so get galvanic. galvanic corrosion and the adhesive does that for us so we oh, use cool. adhesive to separate so it double duties it does it, it's it's uh it adds stiffness and it adds isolation for uh now you had used cast aluminum shock towers on the ats as we well did. is this we any different from that it's a little bit different geometry because the motor compartment on this one is longer than it is on the uh, ats uh, we might have to put a bigger powertrain or something in it and so <laughs> it uh, it's a little bit longer motor compartment <laughs> the v12 i didn't right? say anything right, right. i didn't say anything but uh, anyway so it's a longer motor compartment so the shock towers are 30 millimeters forward the wheelbase on this is about five inches longer than an ATS, and so that also moves the, uh, the wheels forward in the vehicle. And so uh, that generated 36% mass savings. The next one I want to show you is another really big change. And what you see there is the, that, that picture is the aluminum front cradle for this vehicle, and we took 60% of the mass out. The previous one uh, came in in steel. This one is uh, only um, total uh, mass on the front cradle is 24.6 pounds, and 24.8 it says on the digital scale. But we took 60% of the mass out. The previous one is uh, all steel, and it's a weldment, and it comes in over 60 pounds, 61 uh, pounds That's to be exact. That's a lot of difference. 60% mass reduction has, has to uh, perform the same function. Okay, this one uh, holds similar powertrains. This is what the engine and transmission are mounted to, is what the front suspension and steering gear is mounted to, but a 60% mass reduction uh, through intelligent design and the right use of materials. And this is a combination of extrusions, castings, and a few small brackets. Yeah. That's impressive. Okay, next, I'm gonna show you the instrument panel structure. On the left, just blows me away. On the left is <laughs> the cast magnesium beam that is the structure for the 2013 car, and that comes in at 21.6 pounds. Okay, um, on the right is the new structure for 2014, and it is a uh, tubular aluminum structure with extrusions that are welded onto it, and it comes in at actually 14.4 pounds, and so we save 33% of the mass here, 
it's lighter, it's stiffer, and it's significantly less expensive. It, it's amazing when you say that it's stiffer because it looks like this spindly it, little it, it, thing right. next to the it. big, strong, it. It old one. If you torsion, the mag one would be much, much You, you would think so, but here's the issue, okay? With the brackets that we have attached, we can attach them to the body and to the instrument panel in the places we need them. And we, with the weld, because it's a welded structure, I can put the attachments exactly where they need to be. On a casting, it's more of a challenge because you have to flow this material through this part and it's homogeneous and you got to get the material all the way out to the corners and so um, it just takes a lot more material and normally you'd think magnesium would be lighter. It is uh, on a small little ingot of the same size but the one on the right is a far more efficient structure and it does a better job at it. But a, a lot more fabrication involved in it. It too. does. It takes some uh, welding tools that we need to do that but they're extrusions and extrusions are cheap. Prime, they're the lowest <laughs> form of tooling. Yeah. Okay, and they also uh, are very quick to go ahead and create, but they're also light because what's at the center of an extrusion? Air. Air. Yeah. Okay, what's at the center of uh, the tube? Air. Air. The dyes are cheap. You, you got it, yeah. but you get your section uh, properties from getting the material out to the surface and the extrusion in the tube are the best way to do that. You know, and that's very interesting what you're saying of casting this in magnesium. And you're absolutely right. You right. got to get it to flow to everything. So I can see where you'd yeah. end up with more material than you need. And the tools for large castings like that are very expensive also. So this one wins on all fronts. It's mm. lighter, it's stiffer, and it's less expensive. So we could put the money in different technology where the customer will appreciate it in terms of features and uh, other things that uh, look great. Hmm. So, all right, the next component we're going to talk about is the, um, actually, this one is the doors, uh, with the aluminum front doors. And actually, all four doors on this car are made of aluminum. Aluminum outer, aluminum inner, and aluminum header. And they're fully framed. And they're fully framed in aluminum. And the only piece that's steel is a beam that goes through the side of it for impact uh, uh, performance. We say 55 pounds by going from steel to aluminum doors. With all four doors. With all four doors, 33 in the front, 22 in the rear. The rear doors are actually longer, okay, because the car is longer, the rear seat is a little bit more spacious, and they're lighter, 22 pounds lighter, and they're bigger than the steel doors they replace. And that's gotta be nice, getting in and out of the car, having a much lighter door. They are. We save 43% of the mass on the doors <sighs> by going to aluminum. Man. So. Now, the only thing is with lighter doors is you're getting out on a windy day or you just push to it. Sometimes the door can get away from you. Too. Yeah, we, we have what we call the, the check link is uh, in the door and actually we tune the check link. So if we'll show later the closing of the door sound. It's got that uh, vault like sound like a refrigerator door. Mm -hmm. And so it's got the, the very solid damped sound, very quiet. Uh, we control the rate with the check link and so it doesn't really feel much different. Mm -hmm. So. All right, next, I'm gonna show you the B-pillar structure. Um, and the B-pillar is the structural element that is between the front and rear door, and it, uh, it goes from roof to rocker. What's interesting about this is we use what we call our tailor rolled blank to create the material. And if you ever helped your mother when you were a kid make cookies or pizza, in my case, pizza, Peter, probably yours, pizza also, okay. But a good we'll, Italian. There you right. go. That's, a, that's a right, okay. <laughs> but if you're rolling out the dough, the more pressure you put on the roller, the thinner the material, the lighter the pressure, the thicker the material, the thicker the dough. So you've got the big fat cookies or the thin cookies that might have burned. We do use that same approach when rolling the steel out in the mill. Now, first of all, this is uh, ultra high strength steel, okay. Um, but we vary the gauge thickness from... 1.9 in the middle, where it needs to be the stiffest for the attachment of the hinges and for side impact, to 1.4 out at the ends, where it attaches to the roof and the rocker. And we were able to save uh, by doing this. And we went from also the 2013 uh, is an eight-piece design with welded reinforcements in it. This one is a two-piece design. It's a one-piece stamping with one reinforcement in there for the hinge attachments, okay? We went ahead and saved, again, 33% of the mass on the, on the B-pillar. 3.8 kilograms is what we took out of this. We the B-pillar is key for, for side impact. It is. It is. And, and so it's stiffer. Okay. It has 450% greater yield strength than the material that we have in 2013. We went Man. to ultra-high-strength steel, 
450% upgrade in material stiffness. But the other thing is if you zoom back in, one of the things that we did with this is we went ahead and we scalloped the flanges. All the way down, if you see all the little yeah. scallops the there. The sort of okay. tooth Yeah, the tooth marks. Uh, cut, yes, yeah. all right. And so in between those where you see the widest part of the scallop is where there's a weld, okay? In between it, it's an unstressed area. And um, we removed that unstressed area for mass reduction on the B-pillars, on the upper motor compartment rails, and the longitudinals. And it allowed us to take another three kilograms out of the car by just going ahead and scalloping it. Chipping away at, you, you know. You got it. And yeah. so this every gram, every day, that was 3,000 grams that we were able to remove through that scalloping. Uh, on the That's vehicle. amazing. You know, do you know where that idea came from? That it was actually a Porsche engineering study that was commissioned by the American Iron and Steel Institute back in the 90s, I on the, want to On say. flanges. Mm -hmm. uh, on scalloping out the... Uh, they yeah, did a whole thing sure. of how to take weight out of the body in white. But it's amazing to see mm -hmm. this That's showing right. up in production now. Yes, and we use over 100 uh, meters of structural adhesive also to put this thing together. Which is amazing. <laughs> the original CTS had, I want to say, 16. Yeah, 15 feet. to 18 uh, 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 that structural, structural adhesive. This one's got over 100. So <laughs> structural adhesives is really coming into to play it now. It is. You know, and if you guys have ever done work at home hanging drywall and you, uh, you put it on the studs and you use screws to mount it, you get one level of stiffness, right? If you use a tube of li uh, liquid nails yeah. and you attach it and you use the screws, I mean, that's going to stay there forever. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to creak. It's not going to pop. That's the same concept here that we use in uh, building these bodies. GM may be, the, the, at least that I'm aware of, the most aggressive automaker in using structural adhesives. I think we are. Well, from APVs and from that whole era, you guys did a lot of that yeah, back then. Yeah, we, we did. We used that actually to attach uh, exterior body panels right. on those vehicles. But this is, uh, from a pure structure standpoint, the black metal, if you will, the stuff underneath that you can't see but really is the backbone of the car. That's where we use it primarily. And, you know, there's some major automakers that barely use any. So I think GM's way out in front of most automakers in that regard. It's, uh, it's paying dividends for us. It really is. All right. Uh, next, we're going to look at the rear cradle. This is one where we didn't change the material. Okay. We, ju we used the 2013 is all steel, 2014 is all steel. But just through more efficient design and smart practices, in changing our design philosophy, we were able to uh, take it from 69.4 pounds in 2013 to 54 pounds. So we took 15.4 pounds or 22 percent of the mass. Just changing the design. Just yeah. changing the design and making it more efficient. It has to perform the exact same function and again, 22 percent mass reduction. Now when you guys came out with the ATS, you talked a lot about having uh, all input forces on the chassis coming in at direct angles, yes. not having to bend a, a, yes. an arm this way and then have to gusset it or bracket it. Or, yeah. Is that what you did here? We did that as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, in the story that I use is that uh, just like the crow flies, the straightest distance between two points is a straight line. Okay, From a structural efficiency standpoint, the most efficient structure is a straight line element. Anytime you have to go around something. You have to put a bend or a jog in a part. You have to increase its section height or increase its material thickness to be able to compensate for that jog so it doesn't bend where you put the jog. Well, and I'm going to show you in a minute a picture of the underbody. We use straight line elements. And whether they're the control arms going into the rear cradle or it's the cradle attached into the body or the steering gear attached into the cradle, it's all straight line attachment methodology, and we go into the stiffest part for the attachment. But you know what that tells me, too, is you guys are doing a better job of product development because the reason that you have the, the little bend here, the jog there with the gusset and the bracket is because you get down the program and you go, oh, oh, we got to make this change now. Got to fit it. So yeah. it looks yeah. to me like you're solving a lot of issues it's, way up front. It's much better collaboration between the body engineers, the chassis engineers, the manufacturing plants, et cetera, and we do work much more cohesively, and uh, you, this is the result. Hmm. So. All right, and then last, I was going to show a picture of the underbody of the vehicle. I, I saw this shot already. This thing blew my mind. All right, um, this is the underbody of the car, and one of the things you'll notice is that from front, which is on the left side of the picture, all the way to the right, we've got aero treatment that goes from front to rear, and that's part of what enables this vehicle to have a .29 CD, enabling our 30-mile-per-gallon label that we have. 
but from the front bumper to the uh, cradle, it's all... Uh, it's sealed. Uh, it is sealed. Underbody uh, belly pans give you smooth laminar airflow. Now in the middle here, you see uh, the, underneath the floor pan uh, where all the fasteners are, that's a fibrous material. So it has two functions. It serves uh, smooth underbody airflow for laminar flow, but it also is there to quiet the vehicle from road noise and splash and things you get on the underbody stones. Um, much quieter, uh, does a really nice job of quieting the car, at, car down. And then uh, underneath the fuel tank, you see, uh, you can't see it because there's aero panels underneath it. Even the rear control arms in the rear, uh, we have uh, aero panels underneath, so we get smooth laminar flow, and it tapers it all the way back to where you see the muffler. And uh, behind the rear wheels there, uh, we have aero panels that uh, close it out all the way to the rear bumper. Yeah. And you've also got, uh, you can see on the, the rear suspension arms there, plastic Those attachments for aero. Exactly. Bearings over the lower control uh, arms. Over the lower control arms, again, for that smooth laminar flow so that it, it directs right out the back of the car and doesn't get caught up in turbulence underneath. And you can see lightning holes there in the lower control arms, and that was all around re reducing mass. It uh, wasn't necessary to have the material in between, and so uh, we put the lightning holes in there. And the diff housing is still cast iron. The diff housing is cast iron, and that enables our 50-50 mass distribution to get the most efficient use out of the tires, where I saturate the fronts and the rears at the same time. You want 50-50 weight distribution. If you have 60% of your mass on the front tires, you're going to drive more understeer and less steering response, and uh, that's exactly why we did it. Dave, I've got to ask you, when you look at the effort that not only GM but the industry's got to put into getting to 54.5 MPG, and particularly on the larger vehicles on the truck side, when I talk to Jeff Luke, who's chief engineer of full-size trucks, mm -hmm. I say, Jeff, how are you going to get there? And we end up talking about ATS and now CTS and talking to Todd Pollack on mm -hmm. Impala, the mm -hmm. same thing. Conversations now are tending to come back to these two vehicles as being kind of in the vanguard of a mixed materials product development engineering. Can you talk about the importance of what you've done with these in terms of the corporation going forward and getting these ounces and pounds out of the entire product line? Sure, sure. The uh, design approach that we're using on this is what we call efficient fundamentals. And it really is uh, designing it with that mindset that we have to have the lightest structure, that we were willing to pay a premium for the uh, lighter weight materials. Uh, mass reduction is worth something to you in fuel economy and performance. Um, we also went ahead and, uh, and made sure that the mass was distributed evenly, again, front to rear. Um, but this is kind of setting the tone for where the rest of the company is going. This was an all-new architecture. We had clean sheet of paper. We got to do that. Um, Within Impala, for example, like you said, it really didn't have that opportunity for a clean sheet of paper. But no, we are setting the pace for the rest of the company. And both the ATS, CTS, and Corvette, um, you will see that uh, we believe we're uh, lightest in segment. This not only is 250 pounds lighter than the, car, the 2013 model, it's 200 pounds lighter than the comparably equipped BMW 5 Series in, with 2-liter turbo engines. And in six-cylinder form, it's 350 pounds lighter than the BMW six-cylinders. And then when you go to the V-Sport, it's over 400 pounds lighter than their 550 um, with uh, comparable performance. And, uh, and so the power-to-weight ratio is uh, really in the sweet spot for these cars. So do you feel that you'll win the battle against mass creep of adding feature content when you're reducing weight and you never really kind of get ahead we, of it? Yeah, we have to. This car has more features and technology than its predecessor, and as we've said, dramatically lighter. So it can be done. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of careful work. Boy, we're we're out of time. We're, we're just about out of time. We got some questions from sure. the audience here. Uh, ben, do we go right to rapid fire? Or do we need another commercial break? There's the answer. And uh, we're, we've got a couple of phone calls. Let's, let's go to the first one, Ben. Uh, hi, this is Jeff W. from Albany, New York. Uh, John, I like hearing your updates about um, applications for natural gas and propane and commercial vehicles. 
And uh, I have a question that, you know, we know one of the challenges with those fuels is the space that the fuel tanks require for both of them. Um, I was wondering, for commercial vans and buses, has there ever been any discussion about putting fuel tanks on the roofs? And if not, do you know why? Um, thanks. Bye. Yeah, I mean, you put a fuel tank on the roof. Uh, it's out there in the elements. Anything can happen to it. People uh, drive into a garage with the door not all the way up, and you don't want to rip a tank off the roof of the car. Low bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and besides, in most commercial trucks and vans, there's a lot of room. I mean, they're body on frame. There's a lot of room underneath. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing is, is that you really don't want mass high on any vehicle because right. you raise the CG. Absolutely. And then it, does, it isn't stable. It isn't stable in the wind. It isn't mm -hmm. stable at high-speed cornering. And so having that much mass high on the vehicle is not where you'd want to put it. But he, but he does make a good point. In the commercial truck market, I think CNG and LPG are going to have a great time here. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we've done a couple of shows on that already mm -hmm. and really going to catch on. Ben, we got another call. Let's bring that in. Hi, this is Jonathan calling with a question for you guests regarding the new Cadillac, beautiful CTS, third generation. I have a second generation with the little 300 horsepower V6. It's nice. I always wished it had an LS3 uh, motor in it. Any chance Cadillac CTS is ever going to have an LT1 uh, from the Corvette dropped in with all-wheel drive and a sports suspension as a package? Would you like uh, something like that? The new V6 twin turbo is <laughs> awesome, too, so don't take it as a criticism. Uh, just wish it had an eight-speed with all-wheel drive. Sure, sure. Um, anything is possible, okay, in terms of uh, our new uh, fifth-generation V8s uh, showing up in these cars. Um, I, uh, I really can't uh, announce any future product plans here on this show. We need to do that in the right cadence, but um, anything is possible is all I would say. So. Well, you did mention that the engine compartment is bigger. It is. It's uh, a little over an inch longer than it is in the ATS. And so um, we just, just have to... Just never know. You yeah. never know. We have to stay tuned. <laughs> Are there any rules that Cadillacs have to have overhead cam engines? No. No. Today's uh, CTS-V is an overhead valve engine, right. uh, 556 horsepower, um, supercharged, 6.2 liter. And so, no, we, there is no rule like mm. that. Um, well, look, we've, we've come to the top of the hour. I mean, there, there's a lot of questions, but uh, I, I think... Yeah, sorry, folks, but... Yeah, we'll, we'll get to... Uh, some of them next week as well. This so. is the gearhead edition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no, hey, look, I loved getting into all the details on the car that you got into. Yeah, thanks for bringing the car, David, and looks great. taking us through the details. It's very cool. Yeah. Glad to do it. We're very proud of it. And, uh, you know, we talk about CTS, and we say it's crafted design. It's thrilling performance and sophisticated technology, and this embodies all of that. So good to be here. Cool. It's right. been great having you here. Lindsay, glad you made it, too. Thanks, Thanks John. for coming in. Thanks for having me. Yep. Sure. Absolutely. Good to see you, Lindsay. Good to see you, Peter. Good yeah. And, he, and you're on deck for the next two weeks because I'm, I'm going to be traveling. Oh, that's right, yeah. So uh, I know you got some good guests and yeah. compadres lined up to be on the show then. I look forward to that. So I want to thank everybody for having tuned in and join in in the next two weeks when Peter's running the ship here. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at autoline.tv.